Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Briz Science in person once again. Uh, I, I know, how exciting is that? Yes, I agree. Uh, my first in-person Briz Science in a long time. So thank you so much for all coming out tonight on this beautiful, rainy Queensland night. My name is Joel Gilmore. I'm your MC for this evening, and this is Briz Science, Brisbane's series of free public lectures on science held once a month now back in person and, of course, will be available online after the fact. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respect to elders, both past and present. And it's a great time to remember that the first people of Australia were some of the first scientists in the world and their knowledge of the land and how to care for it still informs our agricultural practices today. And of course, this series is brought to you by the University of Queensland, who have been long passionate supporters of having a true cultural science opportunity for Brisbane. So it's great to be back for once again. A um, couple little bits of housekeeping. First of all, we are going to be taking questions at the end of this talk over a app that you will have. There'll be a QR code that pops up on the screen from time to time, and you can scan that QR code or type in the address and ask your questions in there, and at the end we will get through as many of those as we can. Um, if you are still feeling a bit old school, you can also write your question down and we will collect those afterwards and get through as many as we can. Also, um, we will be having some snacks afterwards, some food and drinks, so do hang around and join us for a little bit of socialisation and reflect on what we have learnt. And hopefully, given the topic of tonight, it'll all be very uh, environmentally friendly snacks. Because tonight we are talking about some superheroes. No, I'm not talking about the latest Marvel series, although it is insect-themed. And I'm not even talking about our amazing speaker, although you'll see he is also something of a superhero. Instead, I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to, we're going to talk about some potential critters who are going to tackle one of the big challenges we face, which is waste, specifically superworms that will eat plastic. Ant-Man and Spider-Man eat your hearts out. Um, and this course is very topical. We would have seen Queensland announced this week, along with many other governments around the world, but this week Queensland announced a new five-year roadmap for reducing plastic waste, particularly around single-use plastics. So it's a very important time to think about how can we both reduce and eliminate that waste. So to that end, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr Chris Rinke, who is an ARC Future Fellow holder at the Australian Centre for Ecogenomics at the University of Queensland. And he received his PhD in zoology, zoology, yes, from the University of Vienna in Austria. And amongst his many areas of research is microbial dark matter, those microbes that are hard to reproduce, and also exploring our local waterways for new subjects. So to tell us more and to reveal his secret identities, please put your hands together for Dr Chris Rinke. Uh, great, great. Thanks, Joel. That was a wonderful, wonderful introduction, and I agree. It's 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 great to have online presentation, but it's so much nicer to be here in person and and uh, you know face the audience uh, in in this lecture hall. So. As uh, Joel said, my name is Chris Rinke. I am a microbiologist at the Australian Centre for Ecogenomics. And uh, today I want to talk to you about superworms and how they can help to solve our plastic waste crisis. And uh, most of you are probably aware that we are in a plastic waste crisis. We produce large amounts of plastic. Um, we use it, um, some of them is a single use, only once, and then uh, it goes to waste. And we're not very good when it comes to recycling of the plastic, and a lot of plastic ends up in the environment. And before we dive deeper into that, I have to admit I was not always interested in plastic waste and plastic waste recycling. There was a time when I was about to explore, uh, explore the most beautiful places on our world, and that's about eight years ago. And the reason is that I'm really interested in the boats, in the sailboats, and uh, a few years ago we found an old sailboat in the US, and my wife and I uh, bought it and we fixed it up. 
and then started our journey across the Pacific. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't always like that. That's like a medium swell, uh, beautiful sunset out there. We had a few storms on our way, but most of it, I have to say, was actually smooth sailing. We did, we did start from uh, San Francisco um, all the way up here, down to Mexico, and then across the Pacific and ended up in Brisbane, Australia, where we still are. And the most beautiful area, I, I would say, was probably here in the South Pacific, that is uh, French Polynesia. And one, one place, one atoll that we uh, liked especially was uh, Raroya, that's part of the Tuamotos. A lot of low-lying uh, sand islands, you can see that's our fixed-up boat um, anchored in front of it. And uh, there are a lot of islands, or islets, they call it like this, on the reef. And uh, there is one that we stayed at this for like over a week. And I have to say, it's, uh, we enjoyed it a lot. It was, it was really um, paradise. You can see um, turquoise water, um, uh, sand, uh, palm trees, and uh, even underwater. Um, uh, corals are still mostly intact, a lot of um, life there. So it's really paradise, but there was a shadow over paradise. And you can probably guess what that is and that is um, plastic. So we stayed on these uninhabited islands, and most of those islands are uninhabited for uh, over a week, and then we decided um, to, to clean it up. Usually we don't leave any traces, but here we wanted to actually go further and pick up what was washed up in the, in the years uh, prior. And you can see we got uh, two large bags of plastic. It's mostly bottles, some fishing gears. We had some old shoes in there stuff like that and that made us aware that even you know if you're in paradise one of the most beautiful places on our planet um, you cannot escape the plastic waste if you if you think about where is the plastic actually coming from and uh, that's a nice uh, stats about this so uh, we produce quite a large amount of plastic and i think that is back from like 2010 and a lot of this plastic or most of it at some point ends up as garbage right as waste um, especially the plastic waste that's produced um, uh, along the coasts, that's about 50 kilometers from the coastline. That's something we have to look out for because quite a big amount of that is actually mismanaged. That means it's just littering, people throwing it away, or also it escapes from uh, landfills and other places. And back in 2010, it was estimated that about 8 million tons make their way into the ocean. And we have about 200,000 tons back then, and now it's more like 250,000 tons of plastic waste in our ocean. And yeah, we all know plastic is a problem, so I think one way to deal with that is to produce less plastic. I'll be doing that. Um, if I pull out the latest stats, you will see, no, we're actually doing the opposite. That is the, the global uh, production of plastic in millions of tons. And you can see since the 50s, um, the production has really ramped up and it keeps going. And the latest data that I found were actually from 2019. And we produced about 368 million tons of plastic in one year. And if that continues, there are estimates that by 2050, we will be producing one million tons. That's a billion tons of plastic in a single year. So that is a pretty scary high number, and I hope we don't go there. But um, if it continues like this, you know, that's what, it, what will happen. Then where is the plastic produced? Um, yeah, th probably what you would think. It's mostly in North America, in Europe, and most of it is produced, uh, more than 50% is produced in Asia, and a big chunk of that is produced in China. But um, I wouldn't really point to the places where it's produced. It's only produced because someone is using it and someone is buying it, right? So if you actually look into who is using the plastic and creating the plastic waste, it looks quite different. This uh, stats actually shows the, the plastic waste generated per person in 2010. And you can see that uh, some European countries generate quite some plastic waste. Also the US. Australia is uh, not that great in the, in the middle field. And if you um, split it up per person, you can see that actually New Zealand is even worse than Australia when it comes to the production of plastic waste. Now, the question is, what's the plastic used for? I guess most of you are aware of that. Um, I, here it's broken down by application. You can see um, we have uh, plastic for consumer products, textiles, construction, but the biggest chunk, like one sort, is actually used for packaging, right? And the problem with that is that's mostly single-use plastic. If we, if we look at uh, the types of plastic, I listed them here. I guess you're probably familiar with, uh, with those, uh, those numbers, right from one to seven, and they cover the most widely produced plastics. And uh, I'll highlight this one here because today we're going to talk a bit more about uh, polystyrene. 
So that is the production of plastic. Now what about, what about the recycling of it? Um, there's data about that from 2015. Uh, it goes back to the 80s, and you can see in the 80s, um, recycling didn't really exist of plastic, right? Since then, we have become a little bit better in doing so. Um, and today, or oh, that's like 2015, about, I would say, 20% of the plastic globally, right? That's around the whole globe, is recycled. The number that you hear a lot is actually plastic waste recovery, right? Recovery actually means it doesn't go to landfill, right? But a big chunk of that actually is, is incinerated. So about a little bit more than 40% um, of the plastic waste globally is actually recovered. And my question now to you is, what, what do you think? Um, where is Australia compared to that? Are we, are we better or are we worse than the global average? You think worse? Okay. And any idea what percentage we are in Australia when it comes to recovery? I was one guess there. Yeah, that's pretty close. So on average across all plastics, Australia has 11.5%, right? And that is, that is the recovery. So a good, a good chunk of that is incinerated or you know, even worse than that, maybe shipped overseas and then incinerated there. So I think that there's quite some work to do here. Uh, the plastic I want to focus on today is uh, polystyrene. You can see it's, it's pictured here. It's a, it's a very long uh, hydrocarbon polymer. That's the chemi chemical formula of it. And it's made out of those uh, styrene monomers. It is, it is a thermoplastic, so it's solid. But if you heat it up to 100 degrees, it actually will, it will melt. And what most people, including myself, probably know is uh, the form of polystyrene that's called, uh, usually colloquially uh, called styrofoam. This term is colloquially used worldwide to refer to expanded polystyrene foam. And that's uh, you know, what's usually used for packaging materials, um, for electronics, but also in, in those food packaging and those cups. And luckily, those will be hopefully phased out pretty soon. And I didn't know this, but uh, even the, the Brisbane sign that we all know is actually made of polystyrene. So it has, it has quite a few different uses. The problem with uh, a lot of that packaging is um, we create a lot of waste. And uh, for polystyrene by itself, uh, the recovery rate is also about 11.5%. So it's, it's similar, as, as low as for most other plastics. Now, that brings me to, our, to the hero of the day, the superworm. And I want to tell you a bit more about our study that we uh, recently published. And uh, if you want to go into detail, it's published in Microbial Genomics. You can see the superworms here. First of all, what are the superworms? Um, and some of you might be um, excited to hear, or I don't know, disappointed, I don't know, but they actually, they're not worms, right? They're anything but worms. If you, if you look very closely, you can see here, they actually, they have little legs, right? They have three legs on each side, so they have six legs. So what, what do you think they are then? Exactly, they're insects, they're insect larvae. And uh, they are in this larvae stage for about half a year, roughly, until they're big enough, and then they can uh, turn into a pupae. They undergo metamorphosis, and then they emerge about a week later as a beetle. So the superworm is commonly known as superworm, but it is actually an insect larvae, and the Latin name of the, of the beetle is the darkling beetle, is uh, Sophobus morio. Now, why? Why would someone, why would scientists feed polystyrene to an insect larvae? Uh, where did that come from? It's, it's not as crazy as you might think, actually. There, is, uh, there were some previous studies out there um, talking about insects. And insects, they have, you can see it here a little bit, they have very good mouth parts. So they can actually, they can actually chew through stuff, I would say. And what has been known before is, uh, it started in 2014, there was a study about the, the wax worm. And that's the larvae of the, of the meal moth. You can see it here. And um, if you look very closely, there's like a very thin translucent film that's polyethylene. It's on top of that green background. You can see that the larvae actually uh, did bite out a few holes there. So that was the first evidence that insect larvae can actually eat plastic. And a bit later, um, a study came out about the superworms that could also um, eat or damage plastic. And those are pretty small larvae, you can see. Well, but you can't see because it's behind the curtain, but that is about, um, about 1.2 centimeters, and the, the middle one is a little bit larger. But we thought if, if those um, 
insect larvae can degrade plastic, then the larger superworm, which can be up to five centimeters, can probably do it and maybe even do, does a better job. So what we, what we do, here's, here's our experimental setup. So we got about more than 170 um, superworms and we divided them in groups. And what they first got is the, the regular feed, that is like wheat bran, and that's, that's what they really like. And we put this in wheat bran so they could actually um, live in our lab, they could acclimate, and we made sure that they are happy in our laboratory. Then after a while, we divided them in three groups, and one group got the regular, the regular bran, right? The other group got the polystyrene, that's what we're mostly interested in. And you can see uh, scientists want to triple check everything, so we didn't have one, we had like three groups of each, three subgroups, three triplicates, just to make sure that we can really reproduce our results. And the last group here, that is the control group. Uh, this group got no food whatsoever, they were on a diet. And you can see, we, we kept them together. Uh, they are, uh, funny enough, they are social animals, they like to be together. Although we could not do it for the control group, um, because if you, give, uh, if you provide no food for the superworms, um, they will find food. <laughs> yes, exactly. So they turn into cannibals and they will eat their neighbors. And um, yeah, we, we learned that the hard way. So now in that experiment, they can see each other, they can interact, they can wave, but they cannot um, fight and bite each other. And we did this feeding trial for about three weeks. And then after that, we collected some of them, some of those larvae to see if they can actually become pupae and eventually beetles. But let's focus actually what happened here during, during our feeding trial. So especially, obviously, we're interested in the polystyrene group, right? So we gave the polystyrene to the worms, and that's something that's you know, obviously not natural to them. So it took them uh, a few hours, but within the 20, first 24 hours, <laughs> That happened. They were actually exploring the polystyrene. If you hear, if you listen very carefully, you can actually hear the crackling sound they make when they attack the polystyrene. So it took them 24 hours, but then they were actually digging into it, uh, boring into the polystyrene, and they started eating it. That was that was good news. So we knew now they could they could uh, eat polystyrene, but we wanted to see can they survive on it, right? And uh, um, yes, they did, so I, I don't show you the graph here, but um, all of the polystyrene uh, superworms survived, except for two of them. Um, one of them unfortunately got into a fight with a, with a buddy and uh, got, uh, how should I say, sustained life-threatening injuries and had to be removed from the experiment. And uh, the other one was actually smarter than the scientists um, uh, <laughs> dealing with it and uh, escaped, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we lost two of them, but all the other ones were, were happy and fine. And uh, what was even more important for us is we looked at the weight gain. And you can see uh, those are the three groups again, one the brand, the polystyrene, and the, and the starvation control. And that is how much weight they gain. So if the, if the larvae eat the regular bran food, they gain quite some weight, which, which you would expect, right? That's what they like to eat. If, you, if, they, if they grow on, or if they live on polystyrene, uh, they could still gain a little bit of weight, right? More, more than the starvation control group that was even significant. So that, that told us that the worms can actually um, use the polystyrene, they can gain energy from it, and even a little bit of biomass, right? And I think, I think that was actually very interesting. Um, on top of that, we were wondering, well, if they eat polystyrene, has, are, there any, are there any side effects on the life cycle of the, of the worm, right? And uh, to test this, we actually um, followed the life cycle from larvae, pupae to beetles, and uh, you can see the results are here. So in, in blue again, that is the, the bran. So we had like 14 larvae, and most of them became pupae and then beetles, right? If you have no food, if you starve, only a single one was lucky enough to become a pupa and a beetle, and polystyrene is somewhere in the middle. So about two thirds of all the larvae became pupa and then beetles. And that also tells us that you know, polystyrene, it's, it is a poor diet, right? But it's definitely better than having no food, and two thirds could still complete their entire life cycle. But I mentioned at the beginning I'm a microbiologist, so we're actually really interested in, okay, so if those worms can live by eating only polystyrene and we didn't give them anything else, right, what's going on in their gut? And what do scientists do if they want to know that? They look into the gut. Um, so we, we, we put one worm to sleep and then 
uh, we took out the gut. And you can see that's what you, ha what you get. That is the mid gut and the hind gut. And if you look very closely, you can see that there are actually small polystyrene particles in there, right? So the worms were definitely eating the polystyrene. And we wanted to see, um, have a closer look at that. Uh, we use electron microscopy for this. And if you start with a regular polystyrene form that you can buy at the store, put it under electron microscope, uh, it looks like this. I should start here, right? You can see that's the structure. That's why it's so light, actually. It has a lot of air in it, right? But uh, it has those honeycombs, so it's a very stable structure. And that is, that is when you zoom into it. That is before you feed it to the superworms. And that is when you pull it out of the, of the gut of a worm. You can see it looks quite different, looks a bit messier, but we're mostly excited about, uh, if you can see this up here, age, there are a few holes in here, here as well, and there also. And we can see microbes, microbes growing on, on the polystyrene. So that, that told us that um, it seems the polystyrene gets degraded and we have microbes attached to it. So as a microbiologist, we got excited about it, we wanted to learn more about, so what's the role of the microbes, right? What, what can they potentially do? And there's one technique we can use to look into that, and that is called um, metagenomics. And in a nutshell, what we can do there is we focus on the microbes, we extract all the DNA that we can get, and then we put this whole sample onto a sequencer, sequence the DNA, and then we can look into the sequence data. What we can do with that is three things. We can actually see who is there, right? Which microbes are present. We can see what kind of enzymes do they encode, what kind of potential functions do they have. And, and we did both of that. And the next slide, um, yeah, I'm not going to apologize for it, but it is a heat map. I don't know if anybody of you are familiar with a heat map. I, I will walk you through. So that's what microbiologists like to do if you look into community profiles. So in a, in a nutshell, you can see those are all the, the microbial lineages we found in here, right? In the gut. And down here, it's a little bit hard to read, but we have, we have three different groups. We have the brand group here, the polystyrene, and here the control group. And the colors in the heat map, that is really just the abundance, the relative abundance. So if you have something that is blue, right, that means there's just a few of those microbes there. If it's uh, yellow, there are some of them, and if it's red, we have many of those microbes, right? And that's how we compare our community profile. And it's good to know who is there, but we also want to see if there are any differences between the groups, right? And for example, here, um, this one here, uh, this lineage is called Enterobacteriaceae, and you can see it's like uh, red, so many. Many are here in the brand group, right? Many are here in the control group, not so many in the polystyrene group, right? So that tells us that's, that's probably not the most interesting microbe for us, because if you feed the worms polystyrene, uh, there's, a, there's a lower relative abundance here, right? But what we are interested in is microbes like this one. You can see here this one's called Pseudomonas. And they're not really, they're just a few in the brand group, just a few in the control group, but there are some in the polystyrene group, right? So that tells us there's probably something, right? When you feed polystyrene, these microbes potentially have, have the ability to grow at a higher abundance in the polystyrene group. So those are the ones we're focusing on. Okay, um, one more slide, and um, I maybe have to apologize for this one. That has a lot of chemical formulas on it, but uh, it's really actually important for us to figure out on the enzymatic level, right, what's happening, how can the microbes degrade the polystyrene. So in a, in a nutshell, um, that is polystyrene, right? We want to break it down. That's this long polymer. Break it down to something like the styrene monomers, right? And uh, very quickly, so basically there are a few steps. And uh, what is believed is that most of those, the first steps, those are um, accomplished by abiotic factors. So you have like UV light, for example, the wave action in the ocean, right? Or, the, or even the mechanical shredding by the superworms can, can uh, age those plastics and introduce oxygen molecules. And then we found a bunch of enzymes in the superworm gut that can actually then go from here and take those esters and then break it further down and potentially all the way to styrene. And that can then be in imported into the cell and can uh, further be metabolized. And one enzyme is serine hydrolase. And yes, it's, it's exactly the, the perfect enzyme. It does what we want it to. It can target this group. And we only found it in the polystyrene group, right? So there's even more evidence that the microbes are actually involved in the, in the, in the degradation of the plastic. 
And the last thing I want to stress about marriage genomics is that we can also pull out whole genomes. Like this one, uh, you can see I found, we found a few gamma protobacteria here, some actinobacteria, and not only that, we could also see which enzymes are actually encoded by those genomes. So I think that's probably the most powerful part of this technique. And if we overlay them, we can see that some of those microbes, right, they have those uh, hydrolase genes to break down the polystyrene, they have transporters to import the styrene into the cell, and also genes to further degrade uh, the styrene inside. So there's another piece of evidence that the microbes are actually crucial, right, for the whole degradation, for the breakdown of the polystyrene. And if we, if we sum this all up, what we think that happens is, it's a, it's a two-way process, or two-step process, I should say, right? First, we have the superworm that, uh, you know, eats the plastic, shreds it, degrades it, and then secondly, in the gut, the microbes then use the enzymes to further break it down. Um, based on our research, that's where we are at. Um, yes, that, that's very good, but of course, we want to push it a bit further, right? So what's, what's next? And um, what we want to do is, we want to enrich and culture those microbes in the laboratory, right? We can grow them then, let's say, here in a Petri dish. And the idea is, if we do this, we can, we can knock out some genes, we can do some experiment to really verify that those enzymes are actually doing what they're doing, right? So far, we have an inferred function, but we want to verify it in a test tube, right? To know that they're really degrading polystyrene. Which ones? Some better than others, probably. Once we know that, we can then uh, produce them in the lab in a, in a higher amount, like the ones that are verified, and then we can further characterize it. And that's important. We want to know, you know what conditions are they working, what temperature, what pH, right? Do they need oxygen or can they not work under oxygen conditions? So we have to learn a lot about those microbes. And, and the idea is, right, if we, if we, if we go there, um, there's also a third step, which I didn't even mention. You can then um, modify the enzymes. You can use enzyme engineering to make them even more efficient, right? Increase the, the rates, for example, uh, of degrading plastic. And the end goal then is, if we can make this happen, to not, not to have, not to have you know, gigantic farms with like millions of superworms, which is possible, but it doesn't scale very well. What, what we think works way better is if you create, let's call it an artificial superworm, and you can see here there's a prototype of the machine. <laughs> yes, that's obviously a joke. That was just uh, something I got off the internet, but <laughs> it kind of it, it helps with the idea, right? What we want to do is first we have to recover the plastic, obviously, right? Then the first step would be uh, a mechanical degradation. So that's the shredding that the worm does in smaller particles. That will then reduce the oxygen molecules. And then we can use enzymatic degradation, right? Using all the enzymes that we produce in the lab. And hopefully together, uh, that will help to develop some kind of biodegradation for plastic waste. Now, if we do this, we're definitely going to look into the enzymes that are in the gut of the superworm, but we're also going to go um, you know, a bit further. As I told at the beginning, a lot of plastic ends up in the ocean. So we are also looking into microbes in the ocean that potentially can degrade plastic, and that project is run by Yi Peng, a talented student by group, and here we look at the marine microbes. And we're not, uh, we're not covering only polystyrene, we're also including polyethylene and polypropylene in that research. And, and this is still ongoing, but what we, what we have so far, um, I can show you, those are some pictures that Yi created. Also, electron microscopy, you can see definitely there are microbes uh, growing here on the plastic, that's polyethylene. And once in a while, you also see those very dense biofilms here that is on polypropylene. And yeah, I also showed this slide because we had an infestation of those little uh, jellyfish-looking things. They're only about five micrometers, so if anybody of you is, a, I don't know, a marine specialist on, on small living creatures, uh, let us know. So far, we don't know what they are and what they're doing in there. Um, <laughs> so curious to find out, but the take-home message is we definitely have dense bacterial biofilms growing on the plastic, and we're going to investigate those next and see if they can also degrade some of the plastics. One more project I want to show you is, um, and that is done by Apurva, a PhD student in my group, and she's looking into the microbes in the Brisbane River. She did a lot of filtration of the river, and that could be sometimes challenging if there's a high sediment load, especially after the floods. It was pretty painful. Um, but the idea is to characterize all the microbes in the river, and uh, we will also look into plastic degrading genes because 
If you go down the Brisbane River after, say, a strong rain, you will see there's a lot of debris and a lot of plastic going down the river. So it might be another source for us to look for microbes and enzymes that can degrade plastic. And um, finally, we will also go to new sampling sites. It might not be the, the prettiest site, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's one that's worthwhile um, visiting, and those are landfills. So we're here in Rochdale, you can see we had access, I'm, I'm digging in here, access to um, a part of the site that was restructured, and that is like a waste that has been buried for like 10 years. So we're hopeful that, that microbes, if they can degrade plastic, we will find them on some of those plastic pieces. So we'll also try to grow them in the lab. And yeah, it was, uh, it was exciting to go there and also very sad because so that's the older part, that's like the new landfill, right? While we were there, they were like dumping out more, more trash. And there are some organics in there, a little bit of, uh, of uh, cardboard, uh, but most of that is actually plastic. So, you know, we recycle, we recover 11%, the rest ends up here, and it's actually pretty sad to see. Then finally, or oh, one more thing, um, Another a different um, approach that we are taking is uh, it's not, not even going out in the field at all, right? You can actually use public databases. Scientists have um, sequenced uh, different sites, different samples over the last decades, and you can access those. And um, that was done by, by Harmony, a student in my group, and she actually um, first uh, looked at all the published sequences of plastic degrading enzymes that we can find in all the paper, all the publication, and she created like her own catalog, and then she used that to screen all the large DNA sequence databases that are publicly available. And what we can see here is uh, we have two large data sets. One is the ocean, one is the soil. And again, that is kind of a heat map, right? So if it's, uh, if it's blue, it's almost not there. If it's red, then it's actually a higher abundance. You can see here, interesting, in the soil samples, the enzymes to de degrade uh, plastic are, yeah, not that many, right? A few of them. But if you look into the ocean samples, then you can see red, there are quite a few sites that have higher abundance of potential plastic degrading enzymes, right? And that, that tells us, well, two things. First of all, we could, we could mine the data we have to see what sequences those enzymes have, and also if you want to go sampling in the future, right? We might not sample somewhere here, the permafrost in Alaska, because there's not much there. But if we ever get the sample you know, from the coast here of South America, we will jump on it immediately, right? Because there may be more plastic degrading enzymes in there. Okay, I think with that, uh, I wanna slowly probably finish. Um, the long-term vision, so where would that all lead to, right? Let's assume we can actually um, grow the microbes in our lab, we can verify the enzymes, we can characterize them in great detail. Then the long-term vision is that we uh, create a bio-upcycling loop. I don't know if you've heard of it, but the idea is that we recover the plastic. Then uh, what I just showed earlier, uh, the idea is to mechanically degrade it and then enzymatic uh, degradation as a second step. We would have those products, those depolymerization products, could be styrene, right, could be broken down further. And then we can use other microbes uh, to use those compounds and then synthesize other high-value building blocks that can then be used for uh, biodegradable plastics. Just to give you one example um, that has been in the media recently, that is uh, polyhydroxyl alkaloids, and that's a mouthful to pronounce, so that's why everybody calls it PHA. And that is actually a, a, a plastic, it's a linear polyester, it's produced in nature by microbes. And you can see actually up here, that is a microbe, and it's packed with all this plastic. What it is, the microbe actually used that to store energy, right? But that could also be extracted, and there are several um, applications here. The ones that will be used, the most that will be used, is for implants and also to create um, bioplastics, right? So that could hopefully at some point replace the petroleum-based plastic, and in an ideal world, we would at some point, this loop would be completely closed, right? We would produce, Plastics, let's say, using microbes, recycle it, and we would not have any petroleum-based plastic products at all. And hopefully, you know, that will help to reduce all the plastic waste, the plastic trash we see in our oceans. Um, yeah, that's that's the long-term vision. Okay, with that, I just want to summarize 
um, this presentation today. So yes, first of all, we, we have to find a way to reduce the plastic production, right? It cannot go on like this. We should reuse any plastic products as much as we can, and if that's not possible, then we should aim to recycle it and not let it go to landfills. If we recycle it, I would argue that the biodegradation that I talked about today is, is probably a good way of approaching it, right? And especially if it comes to the polystyrene, we showed that the superworms can do it, and it's uh, not only the worms, which are actually insect larvae, we know that now, um, but also the microbes. It's a two-step process, first the mechanical shredding, and then the enzymatic degradation of the microbes. And finally, uh, for the research part, we will explore new samples, ocean landfills, maybe even other insects, right? There are quite a few insects out there that might be able to degrade plastic. And then finally, we have to, um, as a next step, we have to um, go into the functional validation and also characterization of the enzymes. And as I said, the, the final goal is then that we have a, a biodegradation that then leads to the biosynthesis of, uh, of natural polymers, natural plastics. And with that, I want to I wanna thank my group here, that is uh, Chari. She was the lead author of the, of the Superworm study. Um, we also have Apurva here and Sam, that were also part of the team. Um, Yi here, she works on the microbial plastic degradation in the ocean. Harmony did uh, the bioinformatics work on the databases. Also want to thank Phil and Sheen for guidance and for the funding. Um, uh, Balashi and Nads, uh, they are from the uh, Protein Expression Facility at UQ, and uh, they gave us good advice, and we hope we will work with them together to characterize the enzymes that can degrade the plastic. Finally, I want to thank ACE Sequencing for the sequencing work that is done here, and I want to thank you for your attention, and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that talk. Fascinating stuff, Chris. I'm slightly um, intrigued by the one bug that escaped, and I'm wondering if there's a scientist out there who has the superpower to eat plastic or something. You know, I've seen the spider. It's probably that big by now. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to have some time for questions now. If we could get that uh, QR code up there. Um, we will also be, of course, back next month on the 8th, so make sure you head to our website, sign up that. We're not quite ready to announce the speaker yet, but it's going to be a great evening, so make sure you um, sign up to that mailing list. And, of course, this talk and all of the Briz Science talks for the past many years are available on YouTube, so this talk will be up in the next week or two. So follow our mailing list for all those notifications. All right, so we already have a few questions coming through here, but um, do keep asking. And if you've got any questions you've written down, feel free to wave them in the air and we can come around and grab those as well. All right, first question is from um, Masto, who asks, termites also have pretty good mouth parts. Could they be used in a similar way? Um, good question. So we, we, haven't, we haven't tried that yet. Um, I don't know how easy it is to house termite in a, in a laboratory. <laughs> that might be an issue because superworms are, are pretty, pretty easy going. I actually should mention I do have some, some there. I brought a, a small um, jar with me. It's, no, it's still in the back. Uh, they usually like to be in the dark, but if you're interested later on, I'm happy to show you some, some live ones that we have here. So um, it, it's possible. We haven't tried it yet. What we will do is we will go through all the insects out there and see what evidence there is for them to degrade plastics. And the ones that are easy to keep in the lab, we might, we might give a go with that. I mean, there's also there's the, the widgety grab. You might know of this one. That's a very, very big larvae, but it's pretty much impossible to keep that happy in the laboratory, right? So we have to like make a compromise here. So it's probably not going to be termites, but I'll be looking into other insects as well. Um, that's good. Th th I think this leads to a question from Kay. Is there any risk of these bugs eating important plastic? Which I might have thought was lower until you mentioned the one that got away. But um, you know, what, what, maybe what's the long-term story here? Is there any risk of these bugs getting out into the environment and then eating? 
Well, like I, ha I have I have to say that the reason why we know it got away is because we found it like you know a little bit later. So we it was it was still in the lab. It didn't leave the facility. <laughs> so so there is that. Um, yeah, I think what we want to do is right really focus on the, on the microbe in the long run and actually cultivate the microbes. And you know they are even easier to contain. So um, I know some people. Um, there was a report uh, that was posted on Facebook and someone said, oh my God, they're going to eat all our eskies. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that is the, is the case. Um, they are, the superworms are originally from the tropical um, South and Central America, and since then they have pretty much spread all over the globe. But um, yeah, here, here in Queensland you can, you can purchase them, but um, it's not that they are like out in the wild everywhere. They're used for pet food, and um, I should have mentioned that um, maybe before I gave my talk, they're also used for human consumption in some countries. So if you Google it, uh, chocolate-covered superworm, uh, you can actually order those. Apparently, it's a very nutritious snack. I haven't tried it myself, but it's possible. That's um, good, good, no, no, multi-purposing, I love it. Um, or, and I like the idea you can buy these, these ones as well. So, I mean, could people actually do like, you know, science project like if someone bought some of these worms could kids you know put them in with styrofoam and see if they actually kids adults me yeah yeah definitely i mean there, there are the super worms they're also the, the common mealworms a bit smaller and uh, and we talked to like a, a school in, in new york for example and they they're running an experiment where they also exposed those worms to polystyrene and i had a few other people asking me how to how to keep them and um there's a there's a good tutorial online so yeah it's 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 a fun project to try um, and they're, they're easy enough to maintain. Great. All right. We've got more questions here. Um, question, question, question. Uh, uh, with my, um, Kevin asks, a lot of questions here. Kevin asks, how is polystyrene currently recycled? Um, that is a very good question. I have to say I'm not, I'm not an expert on the, on the current recycling process, but what you can do is you can mechanically um, uh, shred it a bit, so similar to our idea here, and then, just, and then just melt it down and form it into something else. But the problem is that the product you get, as far as I understand it, is a lower value product, right? So you can recycle the polystyrene, for example. What happens now, the small amount of this recycled, you kind of melt it down, and then I think you can make like polystyrene blocks to go on the foundation of houses, right? And then, you know, once you're there, that's about it. So it's like a, a downcycling, more or less, that you can do. There's also, you could, you could do a chemical recycling, but that involves a lot of toxic chemicals, so that's probably also not the way to go. And our idea is if we can upcycle it, right, we can take something that has a low value, like the polystyrene waste, degrade it, and then feed it to other microbes to produce bioplastic, and then you would have something at the end that's actually more valuable than what you put in in the first place, right? I think then it makes also sense economically to actually pursue that, and hopefully that will also increase the recycling rate. Yeah, fantastic. Jonathan asks, has anyone considered feeding the superworms more of the enzymes that degrade styrofoam to see if that speeds up the process? Um, no, we haven't tried this yet because we really have used the natural microbes that are in the worm already, right? And give them styrofoam, polystyrene, it seems that some microbes can deal with that better and have higher abundances. But we have not tried to alter uh, the microbiome of the worm. Um, we, we were doing this a little bit, but in a different way. We want to, you know, extract those microbes, grow them in a culture, and then test each microbe individually and see which one's actually the best one degrading the polystyrene. So that's, that's our approach. Right. Talia asks, in the long-term vision, would this reci require recyclables to be efficiently separated? Or could you envision a broad-spectrum plastic digesting enzyme that would mean we don't have to separa separate waste streams? Um, excellent question. Yes, uh, it, would be, it would be perfect to have an universal enzyme, right, to create the plastic. Um, I think what we have to do in the first place is we still have to separate the plastic, but I hope that more and more plastic grading enzymes will be discovered, and as long as they are compatible at some degree, you can make an enzyme cocktail, have different enzymes in there, and that would be the best case scenario, right? That you can just apply the cocktail, you wouldn't have to separate the plastics. Then you have one bin that says plastic, it's right in there. But you know, that's, that's really the long-term vision. I think for, for now or for the next few years, we will still have to separate it. Right. Um, 
God, we've got so many questions here. Lily and Mitch have asked related questions, which is what rate do these microbes dissolve plastic? Um, and what's the amount of superworms that are needed to degrade a kilo of plastic? Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's one thing we actually haven't really, haven't really um, verified that well. Because um, I've showed you, we have those polystyrene blocks and the worm eat their way into it. So then to actually measure it, you would have to get them out <laughs> and then wait after that. So we have to find a better method and a very, a very sensitive scale to really quantify it. So um, we can definitely say that they can devour like, you know, like a five by five centimeter polystyrene block in without a week, about 20 worms can do it, but uh, we still have to actually quantify the exact rate. That's something we want to do in the future. Right. Ben asks, can, it's like a tongue twister, can you breed better bugs like you breed better plants? <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> um, I think you can. I guess it depends if you mean with bugs, if you mean the worms or actually the microbes, right? Um, for the microbes, um, you, you can breed better ones, but you can even go a step further. You can have the microbes express the enzyme and then you can actually tweak the enzyme, you can tweak the sequence of the enzyme, and maybe getting too technical, but you can put the sequence into a different microbe, right? We have, for example, E. coli, that's very easy to grow, so then you know the sequence of the enzymes, you give it to E. coli, it goes in the genome, and then E. coli can then produce um, the enzyme. You can modify it, you can stick it in again, and that way you can improve the enzyme, make changes, see if it's more efficient, so that way you can you know, slowly uh, produce better enzymes, not necessarily better bugs, but better enzymes. Right. Um, you, got, you got an energy for a couple more? Uh, sure, yeah, if everybody's still up for it. Then yep. We'll take a couple more and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll wrap up. Um, Michael asks, do we know the byproducts post-digestion? Yes, that's also a very excellent question. So if you see the, the uh, superworms degrade the plastic and you can see small pellets, right, that's basically a poo that comes out the other side. Um, the good thing is that the superworms are not very picky eaters, so you see some of them actually eating the poo of the, of the worm before them, right? So it gets, it gets multiple rounds of degradation that way. That is nice. But Makes uh, that centipede movie sound a lot different <laughs> now, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, we actually have a project right now where we're looking exactly into um, the polystyrene before and after to see exactly how the chemistry changed. Right. Um, Lucy asks, did any of the worms choose to eat the polystyrene over their normal food, or only as their only option? That is a good question. So in our experiment, we wanted to you know, really test if they eat it, so we, were, we really gave them no other option. It was polystyrene or starve, right? I have, I have talked to a few other people, and those are only anecdotal observations, because as I mentioned, those uh, superworms are used as pet food for like, you know, pet lizards and whatnot. And there are some anecdotal reports that uh, they have, you know, instead of being eaten by the pet lizard, they escaped in the, in the tank, went to the back where the polystyrene is and started eating it, although there was other food as well. So there are, so there's some evidence that the mites, you know, there's something in polystyrene they like, but uh, we haven't really given them the choice. So maybe something we could do in the future as well. Um, so one more question is kind of big picture. You know, if you had all uh, the, the unlimited budget, you know, you could that do it. That sounds great, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. Elon decides he doesn't want Twitter anymore, he wants your lab, and he'll throw the 40 billion at you. What would you be working on? Like, what would, you, what would this next step look like for you? Um, I think we would really, we would culture, um, you know, hundreds of microbes. Um, we would uh, see what enzymes they produce. And then, as I said, produce those enzymes in large batches, test them, do a lot of enzyme engineering. So it would be probably microbial culture and enzyme engineering lab. And then hopefully we'll have some very efficient enzymes at the end, if I would have an unlimited budget. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, may maybe you need to keep working on that Mar Marvel movie deal, you know, <laughs> super worm woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, we, we're, thinking, we're thinking about that. Um, what, what's, what's the latest one with Doctor Strange? Yes, yes, yeah. madness. Yeah, yeah madness. we wanted to call it like a Dr. Superworm in the Plastic Madness or something like that. So we, 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 are, we are negotiating about the movie rights. <laughs> Coming to a cinema near you, please thank Dr. Chris Rinke for a very thank inspiring you. talk. And
small token of appreciation, and we really hope to have you back again very soon to hear about the next um, stage of evolution of your work and of your microbes. Um, please join us. Um, if we didn't get to all the questions. I really apologise for that, but um, Chris is going to be hanging around for a little while. So um, if you'd like to join us outside, chance to ask more questions, have a drink, and we'll see you all next month. Have a great evening. <laughs>